It was harder going even than he would have guessed. In an hour they'd made perhaps a mile. He stopped and looked back at the boy. The boy stopped and waited. You think we're going to die, don't you? I don't know. We're not going to die. Okay. But you don't believe me. I don't know. Why do you think we're going to die? I don't know. Stop saying I don't know. Okay. Why do you think we're going to die? We don't have anything to eat. We'll find something. Okay. How long do you think people can go without food? I don't know. But how long do you think? Maybe a few days. And then what, you fall over dead? Yes. Well, you don't. It takes a long time. We have water. That's the most important thing. You don't last very long without water. Okay. But you don't believe me. I don't know. He studied him, standing there with his hands in the pockets of the outsized pinstriped suit coat. Do you think I lie to you? No. But you think I might lie to you about dying? Yes. Okay. I might. But we're not dying. Okay. He studied the sky. There were days when the ashen overcast thinned, and now the standing trees along the road made the faintest of shadows over the snow. They went on. The boy wasn't doing well. He stopped and checked his feet and retied the plastic. When the snow started to melt, it was going to be hard to keep their feet dry. They stopped often to rest. He'd no strength to carry the child. They sat on the pack and ate handfuls of the dirty snow. By afternoon it was beginning to melt. They passed a burned house, just the brick chimney standing in the yard. They were on the road all day, such day as there was, such few hours. They might have covered three miles. He thought the road would be so bad that no one would be on it. But he was wrong. They camped almost in the road itself and built a great fire, dragging dead limbs out of the snow and piling them on the flames to hiss and steam. There was no help for it. The few blankets they had would not keep them warm. He tried to stay awake. He would jerk upright out of his sleep and slap about him, looking for the pistol. The boy was so thin. He watched him while he slept taut face and hollow eyes, a strange beauty. He got up and dragged more wood onto the fire. They walked out to the road and stood. There were tracks in the snow, a wagon, some sort of wheeled vehicle, something with rubber tires by the narrow tread marks, boot prints between the wheels. Someone had passed in the dark going south, in the early dawn at latest, running the road in the night. He stood, thinking about that. He walked the tracks carefully. They'd passed within fifty feet of the fire and had not even slowed to look. He stood looking back up the road. The boy watched him. We need to get out of the road. Why, Papa? Someone's coming. Is it bad guys? Yes, I'm afraid so. They could be good guys, couldn't they? He didn't answer. He looked at the sky out of old habit, but there was nothing to see. What are we going to do, Papa? Let's go. Can we go back to the fire? No, come on. We probably don't have much time. I'm really hungry. I know. What are we going to do? We have to hole up, get off the road. Will they see our tracks? Yes. What can we do about it? I don't know. Will they know what we are? What? If they see our tracks... Will they know what we are? He looked back at their great round tracks in the snow. They'll figure it out, he said. Then he stopped. We need to think about this. Let's go back to the fire. He'd thought to find some place in the road where the snow had melted off completely, but then he thought that since their tracks would not reappear on the far side, it would be no help. They kicked snow over the fire and went on through the trees and circled and came back. They hurried, leaving a maze of tracks, and then they set out back north through the woods, keeping the road in view. The site they picked was simply the highest ground they came to, and it gave views north along the road and overlooked their back track. He spread the tarp in the wet snow and wrapped the boy in the blankets. 
"'You're going to be cold,' he said, "'but maybe we won't be here long.' Within the hour two men came down the road almost at a lope. When they had passed, he stood up to watch them, and when he did they stopped and one of them looked back. He froze. He was wrapped in one of the gray blankets and he would have been hard to see, but not impossible. But he thought probably they had smelled the smoke. They stood talking. Then they went on. He sat down. It's okay, he said. We just have to wait. But I think it's okay. They'd had no food and little sleep in five days, and in this condition on the outskirts of a small town they came upon a once grand house sighted on a rise above the road. The boy stood holding his hand. The snow was largely melted on the macadam and in the south-facing fields and woods. They stood there, the plastic bags over their feet had long since worn through and their feet were wet and cold. The house was tall and stately, with white Doric columns across the front, a port corchere at the side, a gravel drive that curved up through a field of dead grass. The windows were oddly intact. What is this place, Papa? Shh! Let's just stand here and listen. There was nothing. The wind rustling the dead roadside bracken a distant creaking, door, or shutter. I think we should take a look. Papa, let's not go up there. It's okay. I don't think we should go up there. It's okay. We have to take a look. They approached slowly up the drive. No tracks in the random patches of melting snow. A tall hedge of dead privet. An ancient bird's nest lodged in the dark wicker of it. They stood in the yard studying the façade. The handmade brick of the house kilned out of the dirt it stood on. The peeling paint hanging in long dry sleevings down the columns and from the buckled soffits. A lamp that hung from a long chain overhead. The boy clung to him as they climbed the steps. One of the windows was slightly open, and a cord ran from it and across the porch to vanish in the grass. He held the boy's hand and they crossed the porch. Chattel slaves had once trod those boards bearing food and drink on silver trays. They went to the window and looked in. What if there's someone here, Papa? There's no one here. We should go, Papa. We've got to find something to eat. We have no choice. We could find something somewhere else. It's going to be all right. Come on. He took the pistol from his belt and tried the door. It swung slowly in on its great brass hinges. They stood listening. Then they stepped into a broad foyer floored in a domino of black and white marble tiles, a broad staircase ascending, fine Morris paper on the walls, water-stained and sagging. The plaster ceiling was bellied in great swags, and the yellow dentil molding was bowed and sprung from the upper walls. To the left, through the doorway, stood a large walnut buffet in what must have been the dining-room. The doors and the drawers were gone, but the rest of it was too large to burn. They stood in the doorway. Piled in a windrow in one corner of the room was a great heap of clothing, clothes and shoes, belts, coats, blankets, and old sleeping bags. He would have ample time later to think about that. The boy hung on to his hand. He was terrified. They crossed the foyer to the room on the far side and walked in and stood. A great hall of a room with ceilings twice the height of the doors a fireplace with raw brick showing where the wooden mantle and surround had been pried away and burned. There were mattresses and bedding arranged on the floor in front of the hearth. Papa, the boy whispered. Shh, he said. The ashes were cold. Some blackened pots stood about. He squatted on his heels and picked one up and smelled it and put it back. He stood and looked out the window. Gray trampled grass. Gray snow. The cord that came through the window was tied to a brass bell, and the bell was fixed in a rough wooden jig that had been nailed to the window molding. He held the boy's hand, and they went down a narrow back hallway into the kitchen. Trash piled everywhere. A rust-stained sink. Smell of mold and excrement. They went on into the adjoining small room, perhaps a pantry. In the floor of this room was a door or hatch, and it was locked with a large padlock made of stacked steel plates. He stood looking at it. Papa, the boy said, we should go. Papa. There's a reason this is locked. The boy pulled at his hand. 
He was almost in tears. Papa, he said, we've got to eat. I'm not hungry, Papa. I'm not. We need to find a pry bar or something. They pushed out through the back door, the boy hanging on to him. He shoved the pistol in his belt and stood looking out over the yard. There was a brick walkway and the twisted and wiry shape of what once had been a row of box woods. In the yard was an old iron harrow propped up on piers of stacked brick, and someone had wedged between the rails of it a forty-gallon cast-iron cauldron of the kind once used for rendering hogs. Underneath were the ashes of a fire and blackened billets of wood. Off to one side a small wagon with rubber tires. All these things he saw and did not see. At the far side of the yard was an old wooden smokehouse and a tool shed. He crossed, half dragging the child, and went sorting through tools, standing in a barrel under the shed roof. He came up with a long-handled spade and hefted it in his hand. Come on, he said. Back in the house, he chopped at the wood around the hap staple and finally jammed the blade under the staple and pried it up. It was bolted through the wood, and the whole thing came up, lock and all. He kicked the blade of the shovel under the edge of the boards and stopped and got his lighter out. Then he stood on the tang of the shovel and raised the edge of the hatch and leaned and got hold of it. Papa, the boy whispered. He stopped. Listen to me, he said. Just stop it. We're starving. Do you understand? Then he raised the hatch door and swung it over and let it down on the floor behind. Just wait here, he said. I'm going with you. I thought you were scared. I am scared. Okay, just stay close behind me. He started down the rough wooden steps. He ducked his head and then flicked the lighter and swung the flame out over the darkness like an offering. Coldness and damp. An ungodly stench. The boy clutched at his coat. He could see part of a stone wall, clay floor, an old mattress darkly stained. He crouched and stepped down again and held out the light. Huddled against the back wall were naked people, male and female, all trying to hide, shielding their faces with their hands. On the mattress lay a man with his legs gone to the hip and the stumps of them blackened and burnt. The smell was hideous. Jesus, he whispered. Then one by one they turned and blinked in the pitiful light. Help us, they whispered. Please help us. Christ, he said. Oh, Christ. He turned and grabbed the boy. Hurry, he said. Hurry. He dropped the lighter. No time to look. He pushed the boy up the stairs. Help us, they called. Hurry. A bearded face appeared blinking at the foot of the stairs. Please, he called. Please. Hurry, for God's sake. Hurry. He shoved the boy through the hatch and sent him sprawling. He stood and got hold of the door and swung it over and let it slam down, and he turned to grab the boy. But the boy had gotten up and was doing his little dance of terror. For the love of God, will you come on, he hissed. But the boy was pointing out the window, and when he looked, he went cold all over. Coming across the field toward the house were four bearded men and two women. He grabbed the boy by the hand. Christ, he said, run, run. They tore through the house to the front door and down the steps. Halfway down the drive, he dragged the boy into the field. He looked back. They were partly screened by the ruins of the privet, but he knew they had minutes at most, and maybe no minutes at all. At the bottom of the field, they crashed through a stand of dead cane and out into the road and crossed into the woods on the far side. He redoubled his grip on the boy's wrist. Run, he whispered. We have to run. He looked toward the house, but he could see nothing. If they came down the drive, they would see him running through the trees with the boy. This is the moment. This is the moment. He fell to the ground and pulled the boy to him. Shh, he said. Shh. Are they going to kill us? Papa? Shh. They lay in the leaves and the ash with their hearts pounding. He was going to start coughing. He'd have to put his hand over his mouth, but the boy was holding on to it and would not let go, and in the other hand he was holding the pistol. He had to concentrate to stifle the cough, and at the same time he was trying to listen. He swung his chin through the leaves, trying to see. Keep your head down, he whispered. Are they coming? No. They crawled slowly through the leaves toward what looked like lower ground. He lay listening, holding the boy. He could hear them in the road, talking. Voice of a woman. Then he heard them in the dry leaves. He took the boy's hand and pushed the revolver into it. 
Take it, he whispered. Take it. The boy was terrified. He put his arm around him and held him, his body so thin. Don't be afraid, he said. If they find you, you're going to have to do it. Do you understand? Shh, no crying, do you hear me? You know how to do it. You put it in your mouth and point it up. Do it quick and hard, do you understand? Stop crying, do you understand? I think so. No, do you understand? Yes. Say, yes, I do, Papa. Yes, I do, Papa. He looked down at him. All he saw was terror. He took the gun from him. No, you don't, he said. I don't know what to do, Papa. I don't know what to do. Where will you be? It's okay. I don't know what to do. Shh, I'm right here. I won't leave you. You promise? Yes, I promise. I was going to run to try and lead them away, but I can't leave you. Papa? Shh, stay down. I'm so scared. Shh. They lay listening. Can you do it? When the time comes? When the time comes, there will be no time. Now is the time. Curse God and die. What if it doesn't fire? It has to fire. What if it doesn't fire? Could you crush that beloved skull with a rock? Is there such a being within you of which you know nothing? Can there be? Hold him in your arms, just so. The soul is quick. Pull him toward you. Kiss him quickly. He waited, the small nickel-plated revolver in his hand. He was going to cough. He put his whole mind to holding it back. He tried to listen, but he could hear nothing. I won't leave you, he whispered. I won't ever leave you. Do you understand? He lay in the leaves holding the trembling child, clutching the revolver. All through the long dusk and into the dark, cold and starless, blessed. He began to believe they had a chance. We just have to wait, he whispered. So cold. He tried to think, but his mind swam. He was so weak. All his talk about running, he couldn't run. When it was truly black about them, he unfastened the straps on the backpack and pulled out the blankets and spread them over the boy, and soon the boy was sleeping. In the night he heard hideous shrieks coming from the house, and he tried to put his hands over the boy's ears, and after a while the screaming stopped. He lay listening. Coming through the cane break into the road, he'd seen a box, a thing like a child's playhouse. He realized it was where they lay watching the road, lying in wait and ringing the bell in the house for their companions to come. He dozed and woke. What is coming? Footsteps in the leaves. No. Just the wind. Nothing. He sat up and looked toward the house, but he could see only darkness. He shook the boy awake. Come on, he said. We have to go. The boy didn't answer, but he knew he was awake. He pulled the blankets free and strapped them onto the knapsack. Come on, he whispered. They set out through the dark woods. There was a moon somewhere beyond the ashen overcast, and they could just make out the trees. They staggered on like drunks. If they find us, they'll kill us, won't they, Papa? Shh, no more talking. Won't they, Papa? Shh, yes, yes, they will. He'd no idea what direction they might have taken, and his fear was that they might circle and return to the house. He tried to remember if he knew anything about that or if it were only a fable. In what direction did lost men veer? Perhaps it changed with hemispheres or handedness. Finally he put it out of his mind, the notion that there could be anything to correct for. His mind was betraying him. Phantoms not heard from in a thousand years rousing slowly from their sleep. Correct for that. The boy was tottering on his feet. He asked to be carried, stumbling and slurring his words. And the man did carry him, and he fell asleep on his shoulder instantly. He knew he couldn't carry him far. He woke in the dark of the woods, in the leaves, shivering violently. He sat up and felt about for the boy. He held his hand to the thin ribs. Warmth and movement. Heartbeat. When he awoke again, it was almost light enough to see. He threw back the blanket and stood and almost fell. He steadied himself and tried to see about him in the gray woods. How far had they come? He walked to the top of a rise and crouched and watched the day accrue. The charry dawn, the cold, elusive world. In the distance, what looked to be a pine wood, raw and black. 
a colorless world of wire and crepe. He went back and got the boy and made him sit up. His head kept slumping forward. We have to go, he said. We have to go. He carried him across the field, stopping to rest each fifty counted steps. When he got to the pines, he knelt and laid him in the gritty duff and covered him with the blankets and sat watching him. He looked like something out of a death camp, starved, exhausted, sick with fear. He leaned and kissed him and got up and walked out to the edge of the woods, and then he walked the perimeter round to see if they were safe. Across the fields to the south he could see the shape of a house and a barn, beyond the trees the curve of a road, a long drive with dead grass, dead ivy along a stone wall, and a mailbox and a fence along the road, and the dead trees beyond, cold and silent, shrouded in the carbon fog. He walked back and sat beside the boy. It was desperation that had led him to such carelessness, and he knew that he could not do that again, no matter what. The boy wouldn't wake for hours. Still, if he did, he'd be terrified. It had happened before. He thought about waking him, but he knew that he wouldn't remember anything if he did. He'd trained him to lie in the woods, like a fawn. For how long? In the end, he took the pistol from his belt and laid it alongside him under the blankets, and rose and set out. He came upon the barn from the hill above it, stopping to watch and to listen. He made his way down through the ruins of an old apple orchard, black and gnarly stumps, dead grass to his knees. He stood in the door of the barn and listened, pale, slatted light. He walked along the dusty stalls. He stood in the center of the barn bay and listened, but there was nothing. He climbed the ladder to the loft, and he was so weak he wasn't sure he was going to make it to the top. He walked down to the end of the loft and looked out the high gable window at the country below, the pieced land dead and gray, the fence, the road. There were bales of hay in the loft floor, and he squatted and sorted a handful of seeds from them and sat chewing, coarse and dry and dusty. They had to contain some nutrition. He rose and rolled two of the bales across the floor and let them fall into the bay below, two dusty thumps. He went back to the gable and stood studying what he could see of the house beyond the corner of the barn. Then he climbed back down the ladder. The grass between the house and the barn looked untrodden. He crossed to the porch. The porch screening rotted and falling away. A child's bicycle. The kitchen door stood open, and he crossed the porch and stood in the doorway. Cheap plywood paneling curled with damp, collapsing into the room. A red formica table. He crossed the room and opened the refrigerator door. Something sat on one of the racks in a coat of gray fur. He shut the door. Trash everywhere. He took a broom from the corner and poked about with the handle. He climbed onto the counter and felt his way through the dust on top of the cabinets. A mouse trap, A packet of something. He blew away the dust. It was a grape-flavored powder to make drinks with. He put it in the pocket of his coat. He went through the house room by room. He found nothing. A spoon in a bedside drawer. He put that in his pocket. He thought there might be some clothes in a closet or some bedding, but there wasn't. He went back out and crossed to the garage. He sorted through tools, rakes, a shovel, jars of nails and bolts on a shelf, a box cutter. He held it to the light and looked at the rusty blade and put it back. Then he picked it up again. He took a screwdriver from a coffee can and opened the handle. Inside were four new blades. He took out the old blade and laid it on the shelf and put in one of the new ones and screwed the handle back together and retracted the blade and put the cutter in his pocket. Then he picked up the screwdriver and put that in his pocket as well. He walked back out to the barn. He had a piece of cloth that he intended to use to collect seeds from the hay bales, but when he got to the barn he stopped and stood listening to the wind a creaking of tin somewhere high in the roof above him. There was yet a lingering odor of cows in the barn, and he stood there thinking about cows, and he realized they were extinct. Was that true? There could be a cow somewhere being fed and cared for. Could there? Fed what? Saved for what? Beyond the open door the dead grass rasped dryly in the wind. 
He walked out and stood looking across the fields toward the pine wood where the boy lay sleeping. He walked up through the orchard, and then he stopped again. He'd stepped on something. He took a step back and knelt and parted the grass with his hands. It was an apple. He picked it up and held it to the light, hard and brown and shriveled. He wiped it with the cloth and bit into it, dry and almost tasteless, but an apple. He ate it entire, seeds and all. He held the stem between his thumb and forefinger and let it drop. Then he went treading softly through the grass. His feet were still wrapped in the remnants of the coat and the shreds of tarp, and he sat and untied them and stuffed the wrappings in his pocket and went down the rows barefoot. By the time he got to the bottom of the orchard, he had four more apples, and he put them in his pocket and came back. He went row by row till he'd trod a puzzle in the grass. He'd more apples than he could carry. He felt out the spaces about the trunks and filled his pockets full, and he piled apples in the hood of his parka behind his head, and carried apples stacked along his forearm against his chest. He dumped them in a pile at the door of the barn, and sat there and wrapped up his numb feet. In the mudroom off the kitchen he'd seen an old wicker basket full of mason jars. He dragged the basket out into the floor and set the jars out of it, and then tipped over the basket and tapped out the dirt. Then he stopped. What had he seen? A drainpipe? A trellis? The dark serpentine of a dead vine running down it like the track of some enterprise upon a graph. He stood up and walked back through the kitchen and out into the yard, and stood looking at the house, the windows giving back the gray and nameless day. The drain pipe ran down the corner of the porch. He was still holding the basket, and he set it down in the grass and climbed the steps again. The pipe came down the corner post and into a concrete tank. He pushed away the trash and rotted bits of screening from the cover. He went back into the kitchen and got the broom and came out and swept the cover clean and set the broom in the corner and lifted the cover from the tank. Inside was a tray filled with a wet gray sludge from the roof mixed with a compost of dead leaves and twigs. He lifted out the tray and set it in the floor. Underneath was white gravel. He scooped back the gravel with his hand. The tank beneath was filled with charcoal, pieces burned out of whole sticks and limbs in carbon effigies of the trees themselves. He put the tray back. In the floor was a green brass ring pull. He reached and got the broom and swept away the ash. There were saw lines in the boards. He swept the boards clean and knelt and hooked his fingers in the ring and lifted the trap door and swung it open. Down there in the darkness was a cistern filled with water so sweet that he could smell it. He lay on the floor on his stomach and reached down. He could just touch the water. He scooted forward and reached again and laved up a handful of it and smelled and tasted it and then drank. He lay there a long time, lifting up the water to his mouth, a palmful at a time. Nothing in his memory anywhere of anything so good. He went back to the mud room and returned with two of the jars and an old blue enameled pan. He wiped out the pan and dipped it full of water and used it to clean the jars. Then he reached down and sank one of the jars till it was full and raised it up dripping. The water was so clear he held it to the light, a single bit of sediment coiling in the jar on some slow hydraulic axis. He tipped the jar and drank, and he drank slowly, but still he drank nearly the whole jar. He sat there with his stomach bloated. He could have drunk more, but he didn't. He poured the remaining water into the other jar and rinsed it out and filled both jars and then let down the wooden cover over the cistern and rose, and with his pockets full of apples and carrying the jars of water, he set out across the fields toward the pine wood. He was gone longer than he'd meant to be, and he'd hurried his steps the best he could, the water swinging and gurgling in the shrunken swag of his gut. He stopped to rest and began again. When he got to the woods, the boy did not look as if he'd even stirred, and he knelt and set the jars carefully in the duff and picked up the pistol and put it in his belt, and then he just sat there, watching him. They spent the afternoon sitting wrapped in the blankets and eating apples, sipping the water from the jars. He took the packet of grape flavor from his pocket and opened it and poured it into the jar and stirred it and gave it to the boy. "'You did good, Papa,' he said. He slept while the boy kept watch, and in the evening they got out their shoes and put them on and went down to the farmhouse and collected the rest of the apples. They filled three jars with water 
and screwed on the two-piece caps from a box of them he'd found on a shelf in the mudroom. Then he wrapped everything in one of the blankets and packed it into the knapsack and tied the other blankets across the top of the knapsack and shouldered it up. They stood in the door watching the light draw down over the world to the west. Then they went down the drive and set out upon the road again. The boy hung on to his coat, and he kept to the edge of the road and tried to feel out the pavement under his feet in the dark. In the distance he could hear thunder, and after a while there were dim shudderings of light ahead of them. He got out the plastic sheeting from the knapsack, but there was hardly enough of it left to cover them, and after a while it began to rain. They stumbled along side by side. There was nowhere to go. They had the hoods of their coats up, but the coats were getting wet and heavy from the rain. He stopped in the road and tried to rearrange the tarp. The boy was shaking badly. You're freezing, aren't you? Yes. If we stop, we'll get really cold. I'm really cold now. What do you want to do? Can we stop? Yes, okay, we can stop. It was as long a night as he could remember out of a great plenty of such nights. They lay on the wet ground by the side of the road under the blankets with the rain rattling on the tarp, and he held the boy, and after a while the boy stopped shaking, and after a while he slept. The thunder trundled away to the north and ceased, and there was just the rain. He slept and woke, and the rain slackened, and after a while it stopped. He wondered if it was even midnight. He was coughing, and it got worse, and it woke the child. The dawn was a long time coming. He raised up from time to time to look to the east, and after a while it was day.